What's up Dungeon Fighters? This is Muscular Thumbs and here is part 3 for the Comprehensive Beginner's Guide. This will be the final part for the Beginner's Guide and if you watched all three you should have a pretty good grasp on the basics of DFO. In this video we will cover NPCs, Special Dungeons and more. Section number 1 NPCs now I won't go over every single NPC in detail, including their lore, because that's a bit beyond the scope of the beginner's guide. Instead, the way Rise and I format it is through functions. We'll go over the different functions an NPC can provide. Also remember that some NPCs can provide multiple functions at once. Function number one, repair. Weapons and armor actually have durability and a lot of new players can forget to repair their weapons. Ryze and I have been in parties, even in level 40s, where players have run out of weapon durability in the middle of a dungeon. Let's just say that party was not having a good time. Normally, when you end a dungeon, there will be an NPC, Delilah. She can repair your armor and weapons for you for a small fee. The best practice is to repair after every single dungeon run. The longer you wait, the more expensive the repair bill will be. Function number two shops. Most of you should already notice there are a lot of NPC shops. We call these NPCs merchants of various goods. There are a variety of different shops ranging from pots, weapons, armor, artifacts, and more. Shops should be pretty commonsensical, so I won't go into depth. If you visited a shop in almost any game, you should be pretty familiar. Function number three, items. Items are the most important function of NPCs. When I say items, I mean item modification. Technically, repairing falls underneath this category too. There are a variety of item modifications that we will be covering briefly for you. The details will be included in the guide, linked in the description box as always. Let's first talk about item reinforcement. So Kiri is the NPC you want to go to for item reinforcement. Item reinforcement exponentially increases your equip's attack and or defense. However, it's not all sunshines and rainbows. It costs an increasing amount of clear cube frags per upgrade. And there's an increasing chance of failure at higher upgrades. Past plus 10, your equipped will have a chance of breaking apart completely. And of course, each upgrade costs gold as well. Higher weapon grades and higher leveled equips have higher costs as well. It's one of the biggest gold sinks in the entire game. Later on, in the end game, having a plus 11 or plus 12 equip will become normal, so you'll need to spend a considerable amount of time to get this kind of gear reinforcement. I personally just bought the equips from others because failure on an end game equip would result in the equip being destroyed. I highly recommend that you do not reinforce until later in the game. It's a gold sink and you should surpass your current level equips soon enough anyway. Now this is mainly for percentage skills. Fixed skills do not really benefit from weapon reinforcement. There should be a different kind of reinforcement called Suju's reinforcement that aids fixed skills later on. Disassembling and magic seals were already covered but they would also fall underneath the item modification function. As for the last item reinforcement, there is item crafting, which you can do at Rogers. There, you can convert a numerous amount of items into different types needed for quests or for equipment recipes later on. Before ending this section, here's a little map tip. Tip number one, use the map for NPC functions. The map is a very powerful tool in DFO. As you can see on the screen right now, you can choose which function you want, and if you need to personally talk to an NPC for a quest, you can pick which NPC you want to talk to as well it'll point right to their locations. With that, let's move on to the next section. Section number two, dungeons. This is pretty much the last really important section, but at the end, we'll also include minor tidbits that we haven't covered in the other two sections throughout the series. So let's begin. Be wary that this is not an advanced guide to some of the special dungeons, but we do plan on doing guides on those eventually. This section will teach you the existence of these dungeons, their importance, and how they relate to the end game. Of course, we'll also include other dungeon related tidbits as well. Number 1. Valley of the Fallen Souls Special Dungeons Let's cover these first as these will be the most relevant to early players. 
Before we begin, I'll state outright that the first two towers cost a Dreyfus's invite. The special dungeons that do not contain towers in the name will have a different entry cost which we'll cover as well. You only get three Dreyfus's invites per day and they don't stack, so if you got them, use them. First, Tower of Illusion is a tower you encounter at level 40. It's the first special dungeon you'll play in the Valley of Fallen Souls. There are 15 floors of monsters and APCs, and your reward for completion is 4 cards of either items or gold. The second tower you will encounter is Tower of Death, and that's at level 50. You awaken at level 50, aka second class change, and part of your quest to awaken involves playing Tower of Death. There are 45 floors in Tower of Death. The interesting part of Tower of Death is, you are limited in consumables and cube skills. The only time you can consume and use your cube skills is if you find cube or consumables during your run of Tower of Death. This puts an extra challenge for those that just want to spam their cube skills. You'll need to only use them when you need to and it is a nice challenge until you get the hang of it. The third tower is Tower of Despair, but this tower does not require a Dreyfus's invite. You are limited to one entry per day and it is a level 70 or higher special dungeon. This tower is probably not in the game just yet, also this tower is a bit special. You can only do one floor at a time unless you have a special re-entry item that allows you to do two floors. It also has 100 floors and there's no actual consumables involved at all. It's basically a 1v1 against APCs of various kinds. You get 10 cards per floor, and clearing the tower gives you an epic equipment pot. Now that we covered the three towers, let's also cover the three altars. None of the altars are in the game just yet, but they will be eventually. Except maybe one that may never be, but we'll cover that in detail later. Let's start with Altar of Infinity. To enter, you need gold, and each re-entry requires an even greater amount of gold. You gain access to this altar at level 60 or higher, and you also encounter 15 waves of monsters in 3 rooms, but you do not get character buffs to help you out. Clearing gives you 10 cards of goods. Altar of Ascensions is similar to Infinity. The entry limit is level 65 or higher, and you are also limited to a party size of 2. There are 7 waves of monsters, and there's a limit of 3 entries per day. The last one is a non korean altar, which is the reason why we believe it may not be included in DFO Global. Neopol is the Korean developer of DFO, and in the Korean version of DFO, this altar does not exist. However, in the Japanese and Chinese version, this altar does exist, which is why we'll briefly cover it. Altar of Defense is a level 50 altar that you have to do solo, so it will really test your skills. There are 12 stages with 3 difficulties each. Consumables are disabled, but cube skills, much like the other altars, are fair game. You are limited to enter this tower 3 times a day though. Another special dungeon that may not be involved in DFO Global is the Abysmal Arena. It is a level 60 or higher dungeon in the Valley of Fallen Souls and is only available in the Japanese and Chinese versions of DFO. There are 8 floors of fighting multiple bosses each. Reinforcement on weapons are reduced by 80% and you can only enter 3 times until your keys are refilled on a specific day. With all those special dungeons covered, let's move on to other special dungeons, in particular, Otherverse. Honestly, Otherverse is a special dungeon and is really way too advanced for normal beginners. We will cover and create guides specifically aimed at Otherverse only later on. Otherverse is an end game area that you run for gear. That gear is Chronicle Gear and is one of the best in the game. The only better gear would have to be Epic Gear and maybe Legendary. It's a bit iffy there. There are three other verses. Each one is progressively more difficult and requires a higher level to enter. Each of the rooms have gimmicks and tricks you need to understand, otherwise you jeopardize your entire operation. That's really all you need to know as a beginner. You have 3 or 2 entries per day, depending on which other verse, and you can start at level 70. Let's move on to Ancients. This requires a bit of background to understand. 
Back before metastasis, we required running special dungeons in order to awaken. It wasn't Tower of Death, but instead ancient dungeons. This included Vilmark and Relic and others. Now, ancients aren't required for awakening, but can still be run eventually. When I say eventually, I mean it isn't implemented into the game just yet. There are two versions of ancient dungeons. There's one for normal ancients, which is basically how it used to be before when it was required for awakening. Then there's true ancients, where all mob levels are 100 and it is extremely challenging. A ton of veteran players like to test their skills by soloing true ancients. As you can see on the screen now, Enigmatic Blitz, a friend of our channel, is running a true Vilmark. If you want a link to his channel, it'll be down below in the description. Other than that, they do give some material rewards. However, that's pretty much all you need to know about Ancients, and overall, that's about it for Special Dungeons. Let's move on to Section 3, Miscellaneous. Let's just cover all the miscellaneous stuff that we couldn't fit into other categories. Number 1, Champion Break Bonus. As you might have noticed throughout your dungeoning experience, sometimes you'll earn a buff at the end of your runs and in the next run, that buff will be active. That buff is a champion break bonus. To earn it, you need to kill 10 special mobs in a dungeon. Special mobs are just regular mobs, but with added effects. You'll notice them periodically throughout your dungeoning experience. You'll notice it activate when you see the break bonus avatar on the top right corner of the screen go on fire. It only happens after 10 special mobs have been eliminated. So you don't need to do a full clear to activate it, but you can. At the end of dungeons, you'll be asked to pick a card on the bottom row, so make sure you do. Once chosen, that card will give you either a free random item or activate a buff instead. There is a chance of a 100% clear bonus experience buff, 50% monster hunting experience buff, plus 11 weapon upgrade buff, and more. Now let's talk about Gabriel. Sometimes, you'll notice at the end of runs, you'll encounter someone called Gabriel instead of Delilah. He sells equips, cubes, and consumables, and sometimes even gives away epic gear. I recommend trying to buy any equips and cube frags he sells, since normally he sells way below market price. Finally, let's talk about boss uniques and normal uniques. There's actually two uniques, normal and boss uniques. You might have noticed them in your dungeoning experience. Boss uniques are untradeable and are named after the boss itself. If you cannot use these, grinding them up in either a normal disassembler or personal profession disassembler is recommended. And here we are, at the end of the comprehensive beginner's guide. What a ride. Rise and I really hope you found this useful and we really appreciate you watching until the very end. Grab that sub if you're hungry for more Dungeon Fighter Online videos because we will be making plenty more for you as long as you guys want them. This has been Muscular Thumbs. Deuces.